Welcome back to Not On TV, the news that you will rarely find on the television. Things are getting fairly extreme. Things started to change a few months ago, as evidenced by this clip about somebody trying to get on a flight without wearing a mask. Using to wear his mask on a flight from New York's LaGuardia Airport to Dallas. I'm just being told this is the law. I have to get up, but it's not the this law. This is what America follows. If you, if you do not wear a mask, we're going to ask you to come off the aircraft. I'm sorry that you don't like it, but I mean, I don't like wearing a mask. Well, I'm going to ask you to come up. And many of these extreme things are in light of news, which just does not seem to add up. But finally, some of this is starting to filter through. This is a report from Fox 35, who are doing a very good job of uncovering evidence about how fig figures are being manipulated. And these are the kind of things that many people have been saying all around the world for many months now. This was an accidental discovery about somebody quite young who was reported to have died of coronavirus. As we'll see, things were not as they seem. And uncovering a shocking revelation. A man dies in a motorcycle crash, but his death listed as a coronavirus death. The first one didn't have any. Uh, he died um, a, in a... Um motorcycle accident. New questions tonight about the accuracy of the state's coronavirus death numbers. Orange County Health Stand Officer up. Dr. Raul Pino telling us Which one person dead. reported to have died from COVID was killed in a motorcycle accident. I think a lot of people thought that it was a joke that people who were dying in car crashes were literally being recorded as COVID deaths. And as you can see here, this is actually now being verified. So was it removed from the data? I don't think so. I have to double check. We were arguing. We were discussing. We were discussing and trying to argue with the state. Not because of the numbers. I mean, it's a hundred. It's not make any difference if it's 99. Yeah. But the validity that the fact that the individual didn't have, didn't die from COVID-19, dying in a crash. But you can actually argue that it could have been the COVID-19 that caused him to crash. So I, I don't know the, the conclusion of that one. So this is a report that's come through in the last day or so from the Secretary for Health in England. To break this down for you, uh, Matt Hancock has now called for an investigation into the figures. What it means is that people who had been successfully treated for COVID and had been discharged from hospital, if they died later, they were being included in the statistics for COVID death. That's just one of the many um, abnormalities in how we are counting the figures, which means that we cannot put any credibility in the data we're receiving. And this doesn't account for the fact that we know that tests are inaccurate. If you look back at my previous videos, I go through some of the statistics around the inaccuracy of the PCR testing in particular. When these things are pointed out to people and when I'm asked about my opinion in relation to what's going on, there is what is called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is the term that we give when we are trying to explain reality to some people, but the reality is just too incredible for those people to believe in it. So they stay hooked into a system of a truth that's actually not accurate. So in order to try and disseminate or dispel some of this cognitive dissonance, what we have to do is we have to start with some of the history behind how our media was created and some of the factions involved in the creation of this media. This is a Professor Sutton talking about his experiences many decades ago in relation to his reporting on the Vietnam War. Did you encounter any effort to discourage you, to prevent you from bringing out the background of America's involvement in the financing of international communism? Yes, very definitely. Um, for example, uh, when I was at the Hoover Institution uh, in 1972, I went to Miami Beach to give some testimony before the um, Republican National Committee. And uh, although a congressman had hand-delivered to the wire services this testimony, which was later printed, uh, the wire services refused to transmit it to the newspapers. Then when I got back to the Hoover Institution um, in California, um, I was called into the office of the director, and uh, 
I was uh, told in no uncertain terms not to make any more speeches like that and that this information should not be made public. This was the information that we were giving uh, the, the Soviet Union the technology to develop its war potential? Oh, yes. At that time, we were, in, we, we were in Vietnam. And as you know, the Soviets were supplying the North Vietnamese. This was 1972? 1972, yes. And uh, for example, I knew that the Gorky plant, which was built by the Ford Motor Company, but the Gorky plant in Russia produces the gas a series of vehicles. The gas vehicles had been seen on Ho Chi Minh trail. We were supplying equipment to the Gorky plant in the middle of the Vietnamese war and these trucks were being used to carry ammunition supplies which were killing Americans. Now, I thought this was morally wrong and I said so at Miami Beach and at the Hoover Institution and it was this type of information uh, that was suppressed. I think we'd be fairly naive to think that there are not many factions involved in things like war and the information that we're receiving can be heavily distorted or, or corrupted. And it may be helpful at this point to look at a quote from George Orwell. Totalitarianism, a society living by and for continuous warfare in which the ruling caste have ceased to have any real function but succeed in clinging to power through force and fraud. Here are a few clips taken from a documentary called Out of Shadows, and I highly recommend everybody watching this. The only thing we consume more than content is air, but we actually think about the quality of the air we breathe. Maybe it's time to take a closer look at our content. And fear. Access. Our governments always control their content. There is something about the way the CIA has been functioning that is casting a shadow on our historic position of freedom, and I feel we need to correct it. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 Senator Moynihan proposed a bill to dismantle the CIA. Thank you, Mr. President. Introduced it twice. The second time was 1995. Ironically, one year later in 1996, the CIA established the Entertainment Liaison Office, which was specifically penetrated into Hollywood, and Chase Brandon was actually co-wrote scripts. For example, The Recruit. Working for high horsepower, high energy, uh, very competitive people who are driven by patriotism and a sense of wanting to serve a greater cause. I am recruiting you. Would I have to kill anyone? Would you like to? So the CIA was and is in Hollywood, was and is contributing to Hollywood productions and that manipulation. The Recruit. For many decades, people in Congress, when they have been able to, have been trying to warn the public about the misinformation that was being spread by not only the media, but also through the companies that are giving us our entertainment. And this is a classic clip from a Senator Frank Church many decades ago, which is also quite revealing about the hand the CIA plays in misinformation of the public. I thought that it was a matter of um, real concern that planted stories intended to serve a national purpose abroad um, came home and were circulated here and believed here because uh, this would mean that the CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. And we're looking at that very carefully. And here is quite a famous Congress hearing about the same issue. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks 
This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Uh, at CBS, uh, we uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, the ships had been established, and I was told about them and asked if I'd carry on with them. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to the national news services, AP and UPI? Well, again, I think we're getting into the kind of detail, Mr. Chairman, that I'd prefer to handle in executive session. For our correspondence at that time, uh, to make use of the CIA agent ch uh, chiefs uh, of station and other members of the executive staff of CIA as sources of information which were useful in their assessments of world conditions. Would you say that continues today? Well, I, yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations of the period of the 1970s, uh, it seems to me that a reporter has got to be much more circumspect in doing it now, or he runs the risk of uh, at least being looked at with considerable disfavor by the public. I think you've got to be much more careful about it. And while this is more anecdotal, this is a comment from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in relation to trying to highlight some of the concerns he had around the pharmaceutical industry. Essentially, any reporter who would report on something that wasn't quite right in relation to the pharmaceutical industry and it lost the television company a client, they would be immediately fired. In these situations, it's impossible to have unbiased reporting. And of course, who can forget this? Uh, many people might have the perception that governments can't tell huge lies to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I have to go back to work on my State of the Union speech. And I worked on it till pretty late last night. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. There's very credible evidence that Clinton had heaps of information about the CIA running drugs when he was governor of California. And many people are suggesting that he actually played a significant part in directly managing these operations himself. He gets called out here. Sir, uh, the Republicans are trying to blame you for the existence of a small air base at Mena, Arkansas. This base was set up by George Bush and Oliver North and uh, the CIA to help the Iran Contras, and they brought in plane load after plane load of cocaine there for sale in the United States, and then they took the money and bought weapons and took them back to the Contras, all of which was illegal, as you know, under the Bolin Act. But tell me, did they tell you that this had to be in existence because of national security? Well, let me answer the question. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. Robert Kennedy Jr. has for many years been campaigning for human rights issues and environmental issues. And here is a great breakdown of the ownership of media done by his law partner. And there were, there were ideas that were the spectrum of our democracy. Take a guess at what it looks like today. Five. Five organizations that control movies, radio, televisions, magazines, everything that you put your hand on that has to do with independent thought. They control all of that. And this is no, not even remotely a, an exaggeration of how bad it's really become. But so, so what was it? Why did they have to gain control of the media? What was so important about that? Because if you can make the marketplace of ideas go away, then you can have a wish list that you can deliver. Where did they start? They started with regulations.
insidious. First of all, they wanted to do away with environmental regulations because they felt they couldn't turn a profit if all those horrible regulations were there. They did away with our labor unions that have always made our country great in the U.S. because they felt like it was cutting into their profit margins. What else do you do? You go after the court systems. You have got to have an infrastructure for delivering justice. They turned something that used to be a robust, independent body of jurists who would always look out for the little guy, would always take up the cause of the little guy. He had a key to the courthouse. They've taken the key away. I've practiced 25 years. All I do is trial work. That's all I do. I can't, work into, I can't walk into a, a courtroom nowadays where I even recognize what I used to know 25 years ago. So their idea was to return the U.S. to a point where 1% of the U.S. population controlled 80, almost 80% 80 of the U.S. wealth. And you know what? You know where we are today? As I speak to you, 1% of the U.S. population controls 60% of the wealth. You know when those biggest gains have taken place? Since the neocon nuts brought their circus to Washington. But in order to make this happen, you had to have a lapdog media. You had to have a media that uh, forgot their role as being the fourth estate. They forgot their role of being watchdogs for the little guy. And in, in exchange for that, they were willing to give all that away for more profit. So they could squeeze another little dime out of all that money that they've piled up on their spreadsheets. The second thing they had to do is they had to make certain that U.S. citizens forgot what you cannot afford to forget here, ladies and gentlemen. You own those airways. And you know what? I hate to say it. I never thought I'd have to say this. I never thought I'd have to come to another country and say, you, the line is in the sand with you in Canada. You are the, high, you are the moral high ground. We've lost it in the U.S. The fight is right here. And you can't forget that those are your airways. Because if you lose, this en entire North American continent loses. We're in an abyss. It's, an, it's abysmal down there. And so Ronald Reagan, the Borax man, one of the first things he does as president, he signs an executive order that does away with the Fairness Doctrine. The Fairness Doctrine was very logical. It said if you want neocon nuts like Rush Limbaugh and Hannity and Ann Coulter talking their hate, if you want hate talk eight hours a day, then you have to have talk that talks about compassion and our care for other people. And we have, to, we have to have talk that talks about the wisdom of taking care of the least of our society. FDR understood why that was important. He understood you could not have industrialists gain control of the networks. He knew that. He, he knew it because he had seen it happen in Italy with Mussolini, where the industrialists come to Italy and they buy everything. And before you know it, Peasants, people that can barely afford food, are thinking that the industrialist has their best interest. And the rise of fascism rose quickly. That was the first foot. The second, the second foot after the Fairness Doctrine, it was that we had to be able to have conglomerates grow any way they want to without meaningful regulations. So what ended up happening is Bill signs legislation that makes that happen. All of a sudden, news is replaced by infotainment. Like, I really care who in the hell Paris Hilton is dating today. Or I care that Britney Spears is going to have another baby and what the name is going to be. But that's called infotainment. And you know why it happened? Because the conglomerates knew the Amer U.S. public very well. Here's what they knew. They knew we now read and comprehend on a 7th to 8th grade level. That's what they knew. And they knew we could give them entertainment and we could ignore the fact that a U.S. president is committing murder every day in Iraq, has murdered 70,000 <laughs> Iraqi men, women, children, because we want to wonder what the hell Paris Hilton is doing. And infotainment is replacing our ability to get our arms around issues that involve people's lives. This is a great breakdown of the makeup of who is con currently controlling our media. These are the companies that control the five most influential TV news networks. National Amusements, which you've probably never heard of, it has a controlling stake in CBS. Then there's News Corp, which owns Fox. And Time Warner, which runs CNN. And Disney, yes, Disney, which owns ABC. And the biggest of all is Comcast, which owns NBC. It may not be a surprise that the five biggest TV news networks are controlled by multi-billion dollar corporations. But get this, 
almost every other TV channel is also controlled by one of these five. Yeah, all those TV channels you know and love, pretty much all of them are controlled by one of just five giant conglomerates. Not to mention, some of these conglomerates own more than TV networks. These five companies own a lot of other types of media as well. A small number of CEOs and billionaires hold big sway over how the American public thinks. As the New York Times points out, there is an aggressive bid by the very wealthy to control the American news media at a time when it is in a financially weakened state, struggling to maintain its footing on the electronic frontier's unstable terrain. The Washington Post, which is controlled by Jeff Bezos, and Bloomberg, which is controlled by Bloomberg. And also, the New York Times itself, which they accidentally forgot to put in their article, is controlled by Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim. I'm sure that was an innocent oversight, though. Some Bloomberg employees have said it's hard to report on corruption and go after the elite when the elite are the same people contributing to Bloomberg's annual $9 billion revenue. When President Trump goes after Amazon for tax evasion, does that affect how the Washington Post reports since Jeff Bezos owns both the Post and Amazon? This doctor gives firsthand an account of the role that pharmaceutical companies play in the education of doctors. The pharmaceutical industry has been incredibly savvy at making links and giving money to these organizations and indirectly influencing the ways in which doctors are taught to prescribe these drugs. We are required by law and to keep our license, our medical license, to attend a certain number of continuing medical education courses every year. And for many busy doctors, they don't have time to read medical journals and to keep up with the latest breaking news on this study or that study. They go to their once per year, you know, 30 CME credits, uh, you know, meeting in, Wisconsin, in wherever it is, and they expect that there they'll get kind of the state of the art from leading academic thought leaders. The problem is that many times those meetings are funded by the pharmaceutical industry. And those so-called academic thought leaders, their career has been made by the pharmaceutical uh, or medical device industry. So basically what you're hearing there is essentially advertising for a product uh, under the guise of education for medical care. And this clip is a little bit satirical, but unfortunately satire does reflect quite often what is really happening. I founded Horton Pharmaceuticals, a company dedicated to holding drug patents. Our drug company gains patents by hiring the smartest people in the world and giving them anything they need to develop the latest, most effective, most cutting edge business deals. Deals to buy existing drug patents. You are the best, Dirk. <laughs> Dirk's an attorney. Anyway, after we spend money advertising the drugs we've patented and other money getting doctors to prescribe our drug and other, other money lobbying in Washington, we spend, you know, the rest of it on research. And don't get me wrong, it costs billions of dollars and years in effort to develop just one new drug. But believe me, we've got many, many more billions than that. That lobbying money brings us $30 billion every year that used to be your taxes. Mmm, <laughs> your taxes. I know this sounds complicated, so just think of it like this. Oh, hey. We also spend $24 billion in countless sales babe hours every year marketing our drugs to your doctor. And your doctor is the one who needs medical help. They're stressed out by school debt and malpractice insurance premiums, costing each of them millions. Maybe that stress is why 53% of doctors are obese, or why one in six surgeons has an alcohol problem, or why becoming a physician more than doubles the chances someone will commit suicide. Who can blame those emo nerds for taking the bait when drug companies mismarket a drug or two here or there, causing tens of billions of annual dollars in avoidable mishaps and deaths? But don't worry. Our drug company cares about keeping you alive just as much as you care. 
which is basically you don't. 10% of you lie to your doctor about your smoking habit. 20% of ER patients are there to score painkillers that we make. And doctors train to figure out how you're lying to them, not if, because when it comes to being honest with a medical professional, millions of you would literally rather die. By the way, my vertebrae hurt. Mm -hmm. So remember, until you die, or lose insurance, or need something we're pricing you out of, buy my drugs. Drugs that I call pharmaceuticals, so it sounds less like I deal drugs for a living, which technically is exactly what I do. I deal drugs. Hello, I'm Raymond, and I'm here to tell you about my pharmaceutical company. <laughs> this is Horton Turf, motherfucker. There are not many parts of that dialogue that in actual fact closely resemble the truth of what actually does happen. At times, we do have some good investigations being done by mainstream media. And here's one such example. This has only come out in the last few days. And essentially, it describes how some testing companies in the USA are only sending positive results with absolutely zero negative results. Um, some people caught on to this and realized that there's a big problem with this. WPTV News Channel 5's Megan McRoberts has been digging into the numbers and explains why it's raising concerns. Well, one local doctor tells me it appears that the numbers being reported statewide by area labs appears to be far from accurate when it comes to the positivity rates. The health department confirms that there are some labs failing to report their negative results, but this doctor also feels the health department might be lagging behind in reporting the data they receive. In the mix of reporting hundreds of positive COVID-19 test results, hundreds of labs of all sizes statewide are reporting no negatives to the health department. It's concerning to lawmakers like Representative Toby Overdorf. And we need to make sure that our local officials are getting the accurate data rather than data that is inflated because we don't have enough manpower. Such as in our area at the VA Medical Center in West Palm reporting 115 positives with no negatives. Lab 24 Inc. reporting 464 positive cases and zero negatives. Florida Community Health Center is reporting 67 positives and no negatives. Florida Community Health Center is telling WPTV they do not know why all of their numbers are not accurately reflected. The Department of Health says some smaller private labs in recent days have not been reporting negative test results and they are working with them to correct that. But a local doctor believes the Department of Health is also failing to keep up with reporting data. It's been made clear to us by the Department of Health that they are incapable of handling the anywhere near the amount of data that they've been receiving. And it's affecting their patients. And they're just terrified, confused. They're getting so many mixed messages. Overdorf among those wanting to see more manpower to input data. I know that overall our health departments are, are pretty much overwhelmed. And he wants to ensure more thorough reporting from labs to ensure the most accurate infection rate possible. It takes away from the overall validity of the testing. It takes away from that feeling that this is a, a situation that we can trust, that we can really look at what's happening here. And there are more than 1,100 labs statewide that report to the health department. Of those, there were more than 400 that had 100% positive rates. We have reached out to some of those labs in our area. We'll let you know as soon as we start hearing back. I'm Megan McRoberts, WPTV News Channel 5. Reports like this do seem to filter through every so often, and this one comes from a few days ago. We're bombarded with all these new cases and new facts and new figures, but and I'm fairly convinced at this stage that what we're seeing is far from accurate. There are many leading academics that have been calling out lots of flaws in lots of separate systems relating to this pandemic. And in fact, the platform they're being given is almost obscure in relation to the other information that we're continually being blasted with. There are far too many strange things throwing up lots and lots of questions. And have a look at this headline about people who are testing negative, then they're in full isolation and returning positive. At the risk of repeating myself, we know the tests are inaccurate. So this is a great example of proof of this. Another massive issue which doesn't seem to be getting sufficient airtime. We have schools all around the world in lockdown, and these kinds of studies are getting ignored. I talked last time about a French study suggesting the same thing. Now we have a German study finding no evidence that coronavirus spreads in schools. I've worked in health for over two decades, 
and I have no idea how members of the public are not meant to be left just confused and overwhelmed with all the information because one headline reads this, another headline reads something else. Here's another ambiguous title about herd immunity. Just as a comment to make on that, one of the best ways to gain immunity from any disease is to actually get the disease. And if sufficient people got the disease, especially those who would not die from it, then we would achieve herd immunity. So bear in mind, depending on what study you're looking at, more than 80 to 90% of people who are dying from this are over the age of 80. I can't see the logic in healthy people being protected from this. And then what happens when they leave their house? They're eventually going to get it. We know that the line of slowing the curve in order not to overwhelm the hospitals was rubbish because the hospitals were not full. There were plenty of claims and reports that the hospitals were full, but when these were actually investigated by independent journalists, these reports were found to be lies. We also got uh, quite a few questions about hospital bad capacity. Um, and Dr. Murad, if you can speak about what is your bad capacity right now? If you don't know the exact numbers, but that's fine. If you can give us an estimate, <laughs> I'm gonna put you on the spot like that. But how is capacity? Do you feel do you feel good about your at least your hospital's capacity right sure. now? Sure. So there are there. You know, I'm a, I work with Stewart Health Systems. We have three hospitals in the Florida region. Uh, we have seen a huge uptick in um, hospitalizations and the necessity of resources over those last four or five days and. Uh, really over the last two or three weeks as we've seen the incidents uh, increase, but the July 4th weekend was a big one, especially because Miami Beach closed all its beaches. Miami closed all its beaches. I think it was similar in Fort Lauderdale, so everybody kind of moved up the coast to still enjoy some beach time. Um, we still are not at capacity or critical capacity. We, when all of COVID started, we uh, created a platform uh, in terms of how to, on a day by day and even hour by hour basis, be able to adjust on the fly for where we're seeing incidents, what we need, resource allocation, things like that. So as we saw the incidents increase in Florida, uh, our nationwide partners in the same health system reallocated resources to Florida so that we could help support that. And I think that that's going on at all the major health systems uh, across the United States. Um, in terms of uh, our specific uh, health system in Florida, we still have plenty of space. If you're sick, get out there and go to the hospitals. If you need to be seen, be seen. Take and as a further comment to make to that, just because maybe one or two hospitals were full, we have always had hospitals that were full. So to relate this to some pandemic without proper data and evidence is just speculation. We have a saying, correlation does not mean causation. Where has my world gone? Why can't I see my friends? Why can't I see my family? 15,796 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus. 21,678 have now sadly died in hospital. Coronavirus pandemic. Coronavirus pandemic. Coronavirus. 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 Tell us briefly about the Imperial College uh, results that sparked this worldwide panic. Uh, you believe they were flawed. These were the initial results that were coming out and the modelling that was saying, oh, millions are going to die. Here it was 150,000 are going to die. You thought that was flawed. Tell us why. One is the paper was never published, which is normal scientific uh, behaviour. The second thing, it wasn't peer-reviewed. That means looked, by other pe looked upon by other people, which is also normal scientific procedure. So it was more like an internal departmental communication. Uh, and then the big mistake that the Imperial Group did was underestimating the number or the proportion of very mild cases that would, nev would never be detected. That's the main thing with that uh, prediction. And it's fascinating how it changed the policy of the world. Here is another breakdown again of some of these inconsistencies. Everyone must wear a mask at all times. We must get a vaccine right away. But hold on, because while the rate of infection is certainly rising and the number of confirmed cases is absolutely skyrocketing. Interestingly, the death toll associated with coronavirus is not. And as we get far more cases on the rise and far fewer deaths, it creates a very clear picture that coronavirus may not even be a pandemic. 
On Friday, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that the percentage of deaths in the United States has dipped low enough so that the nation is at the epidemic threshold, which means if the percentage drops any lower, the CDC will no longer call the coronavirus an epidemic. The CDC wrote that the percentage of deaths had declined for 10 weeks in a row, noting based on death certificate data, the percentage of deaths attributed to pneumonia, influenza, or COVID-19 decreased from 9.0% during the week 25 to 5.9% during week 26, representing the 10th week of a declining percentage of deaths due to PIC. The percentage is currently at the epidemic threshold, but will likely change as more death certificates are processed, particularly for recent weeks. Now, certainly, as we've seen a surge in the number of coronavirus cases across the country, you would expect that we would also see a surge in the number of coronavirus deaths. That has not necessarily been the case. Now, let's be clear about this, because while we're certainly seeing more cases right now, you would expect there would be a lag behind that of the number of deaths. Even so, so far, the number of deaths is not vastly increasing. In fact, what we are seeing right now is far fewer deaths in comparison to the tens of thousands of new cases being reported on a daily basis. The number of coronavirus cases in the U.S. is on the rise again, but the number of daily deaths is still dropping from the U.S.'s mid-April peak. This is likely in part because younger people, for now, are accounting for a larger share of new infections. Or the other reality, which is that 99% of the population is not actually susceptible to coronavirus in a dangerous way. We've known that information now for months, and yet politicians and those who are guiding our medical response to coronavirus continue to act as if that is not true, as if that has not been proven, even though it's been proven time and time again. What we know is that coronavirus is not dangerous for most people who are younger, who are healthy, and who have no pre-existing health conditions. We've also learned that children between the ages of 0 and 19 have virtually no susceptibility to coronavirus. But there is something else that we've learned recently that's very important here, and that is that the CDC's own numbers now prove that the rate of infection among people in the general population has been much higher than had been accounted for in the past. It's because of antibodies. See, when you contract any kind of disease, your body begins to build up antibodies naturally in order to fight off that disease. That is nature's way of creating immunity. Not for you to necessarily be vaccinated or to wait for some pharmaceutical company to come up with a way to protect you. Long before pharmaceutical companies existed, the human immune system was able to fight off disease and infection. And the way that we fight off disease and viruses is through developing antibodies in our system. You know all this, right? Well, here's what we've learned from the CDC recently, that the number of people in the general population who have antibodies in their system looks like it's about 10 times higher than the recorded rate of confirmed cases in this country. What does that mean? Very simply put, it means that far more people have had coronavirus already and didn't even know it than politicians or health experts have given us credit for. And that is significant. Look at these numbers. Take New York City, for example. Samples were drawn from March 23rd through April 1st. Nearly 7% tested positive for COVID-19 antibodies, implying that infections outnumbered reported cases during that period by 12 to 1. The CDC put the ratio of infections to confirmed cases in South Florida at 11 to 1, which is the same as the ratio estimated in Utah, where the samples were collected from April 20th through May 3rd and in western Washington, where the samples were collected from March 23rd through April 1st. Connecticut, where the blood was drawn from April 26th through May 3rd, that had the lowest ratio of estimated infections to confirm cases at 6 to 1. Missouri, where samples were collected from April 20th through April 26th, had the highest ratio, 24 to 1. Again, this is very good news because what it means is that when a large number of people in any given space have already contracted coronavirus and developed antibodies to it, that we can then interact with each other without fear of contracting it. It also means that the coronavirus runs out of people to infect at a much faster rate. So again, it's good news. Number two, it means that as we're watching a surge in confirmed cases, if the numbers have been correct so far, Whatever those numbers are, 8,000 more this week in Georgia or 10,000 more this week in Florida, as we watch those numbers go up, 
we can expect that about 10 times that number of people in any given state have also contracted it and also have antibodies to coronavirus now and didn't even know they had it. Again, based on CDC numbers. So if 10,000 new cases pop up in Florida, that indicates that 100,000 people have it and don't even know it. Again, good news as we move toward actual herd immunity in eradicating the virus. And last, but here's what we've now learned about coronavirus that's so important. Coronavirus rarely transmits outdoors. A study in China that took a look at over 300 patients and followed them around found that ultimately coronavirus rarely transmits outdoors. And yet where have politicians forced us to be for the last few months? Not outdoors, but indoors. And we know from looking at the cases in New York, where 66% of cases were for people who were sheltered at home, being shut down and locked down inside of a home or inside of a nursing home is not protecting the population. It's making the population more susceptible to this disease. And so we have learned that while politicians are saying stay inside, coronavirus doesn't do well, where? Outside. Politicians are saying don't go to work, but we're finding that more and more people who are already out there have already contracted it. And so what we know is this, that ultimately coronavirus inevitably is going to run through a lot of the population. That's what we're seeing now. We were told. We talked about this in the last episode. Cases are rising dramatically. If cases are rising dramatically and the death rate is falling, this means that whatever is out there is less lethal than was presumed before. This was a panel discussion from quite a famous entrepreneur in England. And some people might discredit him by saying he's not a doctor or he's not a scientist, but basic truths can be challenged by anybody, including you and including me. And as another uh, comment I might make on that is Bill Gates is not a doctor, he's not a scientist, he's not a virologist. So why are people listening to him when it's blatantly apparent to me that he is trying to sell vaccines and we don't take merit in what this gentleman has to say. Every death is tragic, but believe me, we are entering, we're already in the largest recession for 300 years. In fact, it's not just one recession. The Bank of England have said the, the economy will shrink by 14%. That's the equivalent of two recessions. It's a depression. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have two million more unemployed people within a year. Imagine the agony of two million more unemployed people. How many deaths might flow from that? How many deaths are flowing from the fact that we've got half as many A&E appointments at the moment? Cancer patients not being seen, people with heart disease not being seen. And the collateral damage of this uh, campaign of fear and lockdown has to be taken into account. Very soon, I believe, lockdown will be causing more deaths than the virus. There is one other thing I'd like to say, which I'm afraid to say is a characteristic of this programme. So there are five of us on the programme, and I would say four out of the five of us are in the public sector. I'm the only one in the private sector. Actually, in terms of the shape of the economy, 85% of the people working in the economy are in the private sector. And no one here today is going to lose their job because of COVID. But believe me, there's a real risk that millions of people in the private sector are going to see their careers demolished. And I think that really matters. And people say, oh, economics over lives. Unemployment can kill people. And I think it needs to be taken into account. And also, how are we going to pay the £170 billion a year that the NHS costs us if the economy is in the toilet? This report from somebody in the White House came under a lot of fire for attacking uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci and Trump distanced himself from it. But uh, in actual fact, I tend to agree with the comments in it. Fauci has been wrong or he's lied or he's backflipped on just about every part of this, especially in the case of making masks. His original comments about how explosive this was as a pandemic were totally erroneous. He wrote contrary opinions to that in peer-reviewed medical papers. The guy, for whatever reason, cannot be trusted. And I don't think it's because he is stupid to get to his position. You cannot be. So I think there's another agenda going on here.
Even though the president and the nation's top infectious disease expert haven't spoken in weeks, Trump insisted they have a good relationship and said Peter Navarro shouldn't have published this USA Today op-ed attacking Fauci. I get along very well with Dr. Fauci. I get along very well with Dr. Fauci. I have a very good relationship. Dr. Fauci said he found the recent attacks by the White House, including an anonymous memo criticizing him, bizarre. If you talk to reasonable people in the White House, they realize that was a major mistake on their part because it doesn't do anything but reflect poorly on them. As for the president's trade advisor, Fauci said there are no words. I can't explain Peter Navarro. He's in a world by himself. So I don't even want to go there. Under the headline, Anthony Fauci has been wrong about everything I have interacted with him on, Navarro cited multiple instances where he and Fauci have disagreed and said he only listens to him with skepticism and caution. The attack by an official with no medical experience on a task force member while the administration is dealing with an ongoing pandemic was stunning. Hours after it was published, a White House spokeswoman said the op-ed was the opinion of Peter alone and did not go through the clearance process. Another thing that's repeatedly called into question are the big spikes that we saw in deaths. And this headline is very revealing. It's quite simple. If you take very sick people, take them from hospital and put them into an environment where there are other people who are immunosuppressed and who are frail and who are early, you are going to get deaths. This happened in America, in Europe, and in England, and in Ireland. These are the things that we should be furious about. To my mind, things like this border on murder, if not manslaughter. And now we see some other channels calling out some of the reporting. Well, Mark, when you look at the state's daily COVID-19 reports, specifically testing by laboratory, you'll notice that some labs have 100% positivity rates. That would mean that every single test they reported was positive, no negatives. Well, the state tells us some labs made a mistake not reporting their negative test results, but at least one health system tells us they were told to only report positives. When you start at the top of the COVID-19 testing by laboratory section of the Florida Department of Health daily report, you'll see Quest Diagnostics Tampa with 548,000 test results reported, about 468,000 negative, 60,000 positive, 11% positivity. Scroll down and you'll see other percent positivity rates of 14%, 3%, 10%. But as our sister station, Fox 35, first reported, you'll spot a few 100% rates, indicating that this lab, for example, reported 400 164 test results, all 464 positive, no negative. In the Bay Area, we found James A. Haley Veterans Micro Lab, 96 positive out of 96. Morton Plant Hospital, 35 out of 35. Tampa General Hospital Clinical Lab, 25 out of 25. St. Anthony's, 22 out of 22. Important to note, some hospitals like TGH have multiple labs reporting. Their largest reports a 6% positivity rate from about 33,000 tests. So what's happening? The DOH tells Fox 13 in recent days they noticed that some smaller private labs weren't reporting negative test result data to the state. The department immediately began working with those labs to ensure that all results were being reported in order to provide comprehensive and transparent data. It's the norm and the law that if someone tests positive for an infectious illness, it's reported to the state. In a pandemic, it's the rule that negatives are reported too. All of those numbers factor into the state's percent positivity. There were a number of labs who were just simply doing kind of what the default is, which is sending the positives only without sending the negatives. And so I don't think they were trying to be underhanded. Advent Health Centric Care also shows a positivity rate of 100 percent. However, they responded that the state's direction to Centric Care was to only report positive cases. When a 98 percent rate of positives comes in from a particular lab or from a particular location, the, the, the computer system should be programmed, and I'm sure it will be now, to say, time out, what's happening here? And trace it back before it's reported. USF Health's Dr. Jay Wolfson said it's crucial that this data is published daily and that it's accurate. Trust is such an important thing. But he urges everyone to remember it's a daily learning process, not only on how to better treat the virus, but how to better manage it, too. The positives are positive. You know, when we, when we do testing, we don't create positives. We simply measure them. But for purposes of controlling this epidemic, we also have to know what the negatives are so that we can keep track of what's happening in the community. 
The Department of Health said it will continue educating labs on the proper protocols for reporting results. Now, we did ask the state about Advent Health's claim that they were directed from the start to only report positives. We have yet to get a response. We also reached out to the local hospitals mentioned in the story as well as several others. James A. Haley did respond saying they're looking into it. A YouTube channel called The High Wire has been doing some great investigative research around lots of aspects of this. And this is a discussion with a Dr. Kaufman around some other concerns about the whole issue. Yeah, well, I, I think that there there is some similarity because I think um, most of the deaths are actually a direct result or an indirect result of these lockdown type of policies that we've seen around the world. Right, because you know this happened, you know, very suddenly in a heartbeat, right after the World Health Organization announced the pandemic status, and suddenly you have people, you know, that are out of work, right? They're they're told to stay home and lock themselves in. They're put in a state of intense fear, which has a lot of deleterious effects on on our physical and mental aspects of our life, and then they also are basically prohibited from accessing healthcare. So like, here's one thing that's really underreported and there's no certain statistics, but there is a one study that looks at this indirectly that shows that between one and 2% of all presentations to the emergency department in the United States are due to low blood sugar from diabetes medications. So if you're suddenly put in a fear state, locked in your house, your activities change, and you can't access your doctor, like you're gonna have different eating habits, different activities, so your insulin or other requirements for those medications are gonna change. And people were afraid to go to the ER in an emergency, even with heart attacks and things like that, because they thought they would get this virus and die. So I think a lot of it is just from not having access to that type of care, and people simply got very sick and died in their homes. Uh, we've seen many, many other factors, like we've seen a big increase in suicides um, yep. because of all the right devastation that people have had in their lives. Uh, there's increased addiction because, you know, liquor stores were always maintained as an essential business. And uh, being a psychiatrist, I, I was curious and found out that actually street drugs were still available um, and plentiful, so people still had access to this, but a lot of extra time, and then they started getting government checks, so they had sort of free money. Um, then there was, of course, the mismanagement in the hospitals and the nursing homes, and I don't think we can underestimate this. You know, I have this kind of vision of what went on in the nursing homes, that they sent people who were ill there. They said they were COVID positive. Everyone was totally scared to go near them, so they essentially neglected them, they, uh, you know, had a DNR status on people, even if it was against the family not wishes. Resuscitate, right? Yep. Exactly. And uh, I even heard uh, testimony from some nursing care um, nurses that worked in these facilities that they couldn't even get access to regular pharmaceuticals, that they were just sending things like morphine and uh, hospice end of life type drugs. So they didn't even have, you know, the normal aspect. They are giving their opinions about actual reports that they can visualize. They're not making up things. They are not giving misinformation. It seems to be now that there is a situation where people just simply cannot question the narrative that we're being fed. When we consider that this virus started in one of the most polluted areas in the world, and when we also consider that elevated deaths were in areas like New York and Milan, which have huge incidences of pollution, it seems quite incredible to me that we're looking for a tiny non-specific viral particle when it could be possible that some of these deaths could be attributed to things like pollution or air quality, especially in people who already have compromised immune systems. There's a headline that came out and I thought this was really interesting because for the first time it's actually um, linking COVID-19, the infection, the spread of it to industrial chemicals. The headline, scientists pin blame for some coronavirus deaths on air pollution, PFAS, and other chemicals. So there's two parts this story goes. And again, I thought it was interesting because we haven't had uh, the finger blamed on industry yet. So this is another headline that's barely received any coverage. The, it starts out and it cites a, an air pollution study that's done out of China. So what they did was they looked at 120 cities uh, from July 23rd, and that's the first day of the lockdown, all the way to February 29th. 
and they looked at six different types of air pollutants out of China. Now, as, as some of the viewers may know, Wuhan, China, where this uh, outbreak allegedly began, is notorious for its pollution. I mean, to the point where people were protesting in the streets by the thousands before we even heard of the coronavirus. So uh, a lot of people early on said, hey, look, this, it may be an air pollution situation that's really amplifying these cases in the hospitals and the emergency rooms. So the study, it concluded out of China that, uh, quote, our study suggests that there is a statistically significant relationship between air pollution and COVID-19 infection. Short-term exposure to higher concentrations of five of those six air pollutants was associated with increased risk for COVID-19 infection. Uh, now, a similar studies found the same thing out of uh, Northern Italy. And if you remember, that's where it jumped. That became the new Wuhan center early on in the outbreak. So, um, you know, it leads to a lot of questions. Was it directly air pollution? Is it kind of air pollution or, you know, what's going on with that but it is a, it is an interesting data point and you got to think that some of these respiratory units and some of these people were going in there with air pollution symptoms with respiratory disease from air pollution that were labeled COVID early on in, in Italy and China at least. Now to me the correlation between heavy pollution and people who have lung conditions and who have some sorts of immunosuppression the correlation of them dying from problems associated with, with respiratory conditions makes a lot more sense than some tiny little particle that might be flying around in the air. And we have to again question why these kinds of articles are not getting more coverage. We've had Bill Gates say recently that vaccine makers should be indemnified against any repercussions if their vaccines were to do harm. And reports like this give me great cause for concern. We have Black Lives Matter, which seems to have been dominating the headlines recently. How do we feel about a medication which has shown to have some harm being rushed out and tested on black people in Africa? First malaria vaccine after 30 years of research, this is backed by Bill Gates, gets a green light. Um, and it's funded by uh, uh, something called the Path Malaria Vaccine Initiative, along with okay. GlaxoSmithKline, this collaborative. So. Uh, PATH is funded by the Bill and G Melinda Gates Foundation, which poured more than 20, 200 million into the project. GSK said it has spent more than 365 million on the effort. So, you know, okay. almost almost half a Bill and Melinda Gates vaccine. So that was 2015. Now we fast forward to 2019, and this is out of Science Mag, and we start seeing this progression timeline here in the media. Okay. Uh, first malaria vaccine rolled out in Africa, despite limited efficacy. And wait for it, nagging safety concerns. Oh, it's just those nagging, just kind of oh, like man. a little spectrum of my finger. Feisty little safety concerns. Yeah, okay. just uh, no big deal. So, um, <laughs> so the the rollout uh, it it basically was in two African countries, um, and they say in the article it isn't quite the breakthrough the field has been waiting for. Most Curex, that's actually the name of this vaccine. Efficiency and durability are mediocre. Four doses offer only 30% 30 30 per protection against severe malaria for no more than four years. Some experts question whether that is worth the cost and effort. The biggest concern, however, is about vaccine safety. Personally, I'm very uncomfortable about things like this, and I think more of us need to be speaking up and asking questions. The keywords here are limited efficiency and nagging safety concerns. This is incredible. In my previous show, we talked about masks and we talked about the science behind masks. What I want you to remember is that expert opinion is not scientific or empirical data. We have data to suggest that there's no benefit from wearing masks when it comes to the stop of spreading a virus. We have lots of studies showing that masks stop droplets. That's it. There's absolutely no data to say that that stopping of droplets prevents anything and even the mask manufacturers are telling us this, and we have this hysteria about putting things on our face which have absolutely no effect. Not only that, but many areas around the world, especially in America, are looking like they're going to mandate these things. At what point are we going to start looking at the logic and looking at the facts and start standing up and saying enough is enough? There is a huge imbalance around what we're hearing. We are only hearing one side of the narrative. 
Some of the headlines do tend to sneak through, but they are given no coverage or insufficient coverage. Um, are you saying that there is no virus out there that is sweeping the nation right now? Or are you saying that this is simply uh, like every other coronavirus every year or maybe the identical coronavirus? They're just making something, you know, new about something old. What is, what is your, you know, exact perspective on what is making people sick? Yeah, well, I think that I think that's a question that we need to answer separately, and there may be a different answer depending on the geographic location um, and exactly what what has happened. But what I am saying for sure is that there is not one scientist who has isolated or purified a virus and made a concrete association with a new illness. So there's no science that proves that or anywhere even close to proving that. So there have been spikes in mortality around the world in different places, but we need to look for other causes or explanations of that since there's no solid evidence that there's a virus causing any of it. Okay, then let me ask you this question because just recently reported that in Spain, they're saying they found that SARS-CoV-2, I believe it was, uh, in the sewage from all the way back March 2019. We're seeing, you know, uh, blood tests that are going back in different countries. They're showing maybe it came here before Wuhan. What is it they're testing for and seeing if it's not SARS-CoV-2? Remember, everybody, knowledge is power. If we have questions, we need to ask them. Unfortunately, too many times in the past, expert opinion has proven to be wrong. I do think there is cognitive dissonance, but we can see that yes, it is fully possible for the media to be controlled and therefore the narrative through the media being controlled. I've done numerous posts about this on LinkedIn, and my suggestion for the last few months is to turn off the television, the narrative quite simply, is either an absolute lie or is grossly inaccurate. Ask questions. Do your own research. The social tolls from the restrictions being put in place for something that is not as lethal as a bad influenza are abhorrent. We need to be asking our state members or our politicians or our local representatives for answers, especially when it comes to draconian rules. We saw what happened after 9-11. We did not get some liberties back. And the same thing is going to happen again. That's it from Not On TV. Ask questions and I'll talk to you soon.